Well, a good morning to you and blessings in the name of Jesus. It is good to be together again. We're going to be carrying forward the subject of relationships and this morning uh, planning to look at communication uh, in our relationships. Uh, relationships are uh, begun and sustained in many ways through our communication, our ability to talk to each other, listen to each other. I'm going to be uh, looking at a scripture in Matthew chapter 12. And um, when I think about uh, communication, the scriptures have uh, so much to say. There are many proverbs about our speech, our words. Uh, there are numerous passages in the uh, both Old Testament and New Testament that address our speech. Uh, Jesus had much to say about speech. We're going to be looking uh, particularly at some of Jesus' words. <clears throat> uh, when I am uh, asked to speak on a subject, I enjoy looking at Jesus' words. It helps me to think about uh, what he would have to say uh, on a subject. And I think about uh, if Jesus were here physically and were speaking to Sandy Ridge, on the subject of uh, how to speak to each other, how to listen to each other, our communication, uh, what would he have to say? Um, I don't know specifically what he would say to you as a congregation, but we do have his words recorded. We're so grateful for those who faithfully wrote down uh, the teachings, uh, the actions, the messages uh, from Jesus. So I'm going to... Um, be looking just at principles this morning. Uh, we'll, we'll look at a number of, of scriptures. Obviously not going to be able to talk about all that the scriptures have to say, but we'll focus in on uh, just a number of uh, basic principles about communication. And the first one here is in Matthew chapter 12. First principle we're going to be looking at is uh, Jesus teaching on it's out of the heart that the mouth speaks. So the quality of the heart determines the quality of the communication. So we're back again to a, a kind of a theme that we've been looking at in this uh, in this series, when we talk about relating to each other, it really comes back to the kind of people that we are. And uh, we've looked at uh, God being a God of love and a God of truth. And in that, God wants us to become loving and true. And out of our, out of our heart, then uh, we can interact with each other. <clears throat> so I'd like to read uh, these uh, two verses here uh, that I have listed, verses 34 and 35. Jesus begins here, well, I should back up uh, if you have your Bibles, let's look at verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. He goes on to say uh, every word, every idle word that we speak, we will give account for it. Just highlighting the, uh, in, for Jesus the uh, significance of our words. Uh, so God cares about our speech. He cares about the things we say to each other. He cares about how well we hear each other, how well we represent each other. So how we speak to each other, how we speak about each other, all of these are things that are important to God. One of the Proverbs highlights the power of speech, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so it's, uh, our words are to be good words, words that give life rather than words that take life. And um, recently uh, studying this passage, I looked at it more in its context. And um, I'm not going to be able to go into all that is involved in the context here, but it really helped me to understand Jesus' words. When I look back, uh, the... the um, 
the, the events that preceded this. And there, there are two events in the beginning of the chapter where Jesus did things on the Sabbath that made the Pharisees upset. They were angry at him. And uh, they actually set about to do him harm, to, uh, to kill him. And <clears throat> uh, it says then that there were many people who came to Jesus uh, after these events and um, he healed them. And uh, you, you'll see Jesus uh, responding here to the needs of people. But I want you to notice, if you back up to verse 22, notice uh, how the particular teaching that he gives here is sourced in this, in this event. In verse 22, one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind, and mute. Now, three descriptors there. He was demon-possessed, he was blind, he was mute. Now, one of the things about the gospel writers is that they are so succinct, just so um, kind of bare bones in the, in the stories. The next three words, uh, four words, and he healed him. And then it says... So that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And that's all it says about this man. Don't you wonder what he said? This man was delivered from a demon. What were his words? What did he say? And, and what did he see first? What Maybe his first thing that he saw was Jesus. Imagine him looking around, not having seen, and being able to see the sky and the trees and the people. But it doesn't say. It doesn't say what he did or what he said. But it carries on and indicates that this further infuriated the Pharisees, particularly because the people said, could this be the son of David? Is this the Messiah? Who can do this? And then we find Jesus um, speaking here, responding. The Pharisees, it says, uh, actually, sorry, we, we look at what the Pharisees did. They, it made them angry when Jesus was being praised. Okay? Because they're already angry at him and they accuse him. They say, well, he's, he's casting out demons by the, the prince of demons. Jesus, in the, in the next verses, gives a bit of a response there. First of all, just a logical response. Well, Satan isn't going to fight Satan. That doesn't even make sense, okay? But then he also gives something of a, I don't know what to call it, but kind of a theological response in which he, he, he talks about, he uses analogous language here where he talks about a strong man binding or somebody binding a, a strong man before they can plunder his house. Essentially what he goes, what he's saying there is that I am actually here to, to, to uh, plunder Satan's house. Okay. And then he comes into this teaching on our words. Now, again, I, I, I can't take uh, time here, but in verse 34, when he says brood of vipers... Jesus gives some, uh, some strict teaching here some, uh, about uh, blaspheming, about slandering. And he says, if you slander the Spirit of God, he says, I cast out this demon by the Spirit of God. You slander the Spirit of God. And he says, there is no forgiveness for that sin. It, it, it's sobering to me that Jesus says the most significant sin is a sin of speech. They were attributing, they were attributing a work of God's Spirit to the devil, okay? And I just want to say here, uh, we have young people here. I know that sometimes young people, at least I did when I was young, I struggled with fear that I had committed this unforgivable sin. And I want you to say that, uh, to understand, Jesus was speaking to people 
whose hearts were hardened against God. He was not speaking to young people whose hearts are tender toward God. So this is not something that, that young people need to be f uh, fearing. This has to do with a hardened heart that was against God. But think with me, what was it like for the father to listen to these people attributing this work of deliverance to the devil? What was it like for this man to hear? He'd just been delivered from Satan. He was able to function. Now as a human being, he could speak and, and, and hear and see. What was it like for him to hear Jesus slandered like this? When Jesus says, brood of vipers... I think he is recognizing that these people have the same spirit as the original serpent who slandered God. God doesn't really have your best interest in mind. You eat this fruit and it'll make you wise. This same spirit is at work in these people. They're actually a brood of serpents, of snakes. But I'm going to let that, for the context here, what I'd like to focus on is this principle that the quality of the heart determines the quality of the communication. Jesus uses generic words here, good and evil. So he says it's from an evil heart that there is evil speech. We, could, uh, we can break that down in... When I say generic, I'm just saying evil. There's all kinds of evil. So there's gossip and slander and lying and cursing and flattery and name calling and flirting and lustful speech. And we could probably go on. There are all kinds of evil speaking. Jesus is saying that these things come from this kind of heart. So if we break it down, it's not just out of an evil heart there's evil speaking, but out of a slanderous heart comes slanderous speech. So, okay, we can break it down here to every one of these. Out of a lying heart comes deceitful speech. Out of a flattering heart. It's, it's out of the heart. It's the kind of person that this speech comes out of. Um, sometimes when I'm interacting with people who are struggling, they will say, we just have a terrible communication problem. And it might be a married couple and they just say, we, we just have a terrible communication problem. And sometimes it's young people not getting along with their parents and they say, just, I just can't communicate with my dad. And, and yet, if you look at, at least at this setting, the Pharisees did not have a communication problem. They had a heart problem. Okay, it's out of this heart. And when I listen to people saying I have a communication problem and I really listen, eventually I come to realize for many of them, it, they don't have a communication problem at all. In fact, they're communicating all too effectively. They're saying exactly what they're thinking. It's actually the problem is a heart problem. It's out of an, of an evil heart that we have evil speech. Well, Jesus also spoke about a good heart and we can break that down as well and say a good heart is a heart that speaks truth, that speaks blessing, that speaks uh, gratitude. There's politeness coming out of that kind of a heart and words of encouragement, words of insight, words of praise, words that are respectful. All of these come out of a good heart. So we're breaking this down and again saying that if we want truth in our speech, we have to have truth in our heart. If we want to have gratitude, if we want to be a person of blessing, we have to have that kind of heart. It's out of the heart the mouth speaks. That's just a basic principle of communication and the reality again, as I said last evening, we're all in the process of being sanctified and so our words are like, a, are like a, this index. It's like we, if we end up saying something we shouldn't say, it's not enough for us to say, oh, I'm sorry I said that, assuming that saying sorry will solve the problem. Now, saying sorry may be necessary interpersonally, but it won't necessarily change the heart. 
we have to come back and say, Lord, where's that coming from? Why am I speaking this way? It's coming out of this kind of heart. And I want my heart to be cleansed so that my heart, instead of being a heart of, we could say, cursing or death words, become a heart of blessing or life words, life-giving kinds of words. Uh, just another kind of thing here as I think about our, our speech, it's fascinating that if we don't have a pure heart, a clean heart, it's easy to react in kind. Uh, so what's the proverb? Um, anger. A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. That, remember that uh, proverb? So if, you, if somebody says something nasty to you, our natural tendency is to what? Say something nasty back, right? Except we add a little bit because they need to learn a lesson, right? I remember when I was in school, I was, uh, I, I don't remember what grade I was in. It was probably first or second grade. And my best friend, uh, just think, like, it was my best friend. Like, uh, back in those days, it was, we, we would say each other's names in twos. Like, it was kind of the best friend. So it was Kenny and Johnny. Uh, the, uh, we were best friends. And my best friend, I remember where we were standing. It was on the north side of the school. And something happened that really made him upset at me and and he said you are no better than that blade of grass and so I still remember that right I right away started looking around for something worse than the blade of grass to, to tell him he was like that that's the nature of our communication we tend to do this and the only way to get saved from that is to change our hearts to have a different kind of heart F to be able to respond with uh, this is again Jesus' instruction to respond to cursing or words that take life to words of blessing. You have to have a, you have to have a different kind of heart. Otherwise, you're just going to do, say what they say. And unfortunately, we become then just like them, right? So if somebody's nasty and we're nasty back, we're just being like them. Except we add a little bit, we're worse than them, right? We say, we say something worse, so, so it's this, the necessity to have our hearts to be changed. Jesus said, bless those who curse you. Give words to others that will give life to them when they give words to you that take life, that are, cur that's what cursing means. It's, it's words that, that um, take vitality and health and whatever from uh, people. So, Again, we're just coming back and, and trying to recognize that in our relationships, where there have been hurtful things said, we have to think about how can I, how can I give words back that will actually be life-giving instead of these hurtful words. You know, th we, we all can remember, likely remember back in somewhere in our life, specific words that people said. And it's either one of these. It's either words that really gave life or it's words that take life, that are, that are hurtful. There's wounds there in, in our lives. So that's a, a basic principle of communication. Jesus so clearly teaches that it's out of the heart. And so where we have trouble in our speech, if you look back on a conversation you have had with somebody and you feel regret because of what you said, words came out that should not have come out, just a, a sh just reminder, it comes back to opening our hearts to God and say, Lord, I need some change in my heart here. I need something to happen so that I will speak in different ways. Let's go to uh, the next principle. <clears throat> And this principle is um, based on 1 Corinthians 13, very familiar passage on love. Uh, I don't know if you thought about it here the other evening when I spoke on love in our relationships. I didn't even reference probably the best description of or extended, most extended description of love in uh, the scriptures here. We know it as the love chapter. And I'll insert here, this love chapter is in the context of Paul speaking about relationships in the church. And he says, I'd like to read the first three verses. 
uh, the first one uh, projected here on the uh, on the projector but uh, notice uh, what he says though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but have not love I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love I am nothing and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned but have not love it profits me nothing what is said when we speak what is said is not as significant to us as how it is said and so when we're when we're thinking about our our communication there's more to it than just our words and again this is because our words come from our heart here's the thing folks every time we listen to people well I say every time most times when we listen to people we are tuned not just to their words but to what kind of what's it coming from we're evaluating is this okay even let's say somebody gives you a compliment they they tell you something you ladies you know really good cooks I found that out and you uh, somebody says well that was just really good and in your 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 evad do they really mean that okay are they just being polite we want to know we want to know where is this actually coming from and and that underlying or heart uh, from which our words come is conveyed by things like the tone of voice I mean, I can, I can change the meaning of just one word by my tone of voice. I, if I say yes, okay, I can say yes, or I can say yes. Do, do you hear the, the switch in meaning? Just, just the tone of voice. We could, I could illustrate further, but I'd probably get in trouble here, okay? Because we, we put this, this uh, so much meaning into things like tone of voice, the attitude. We're wondering about the attitude. You know, and people in church sometimes will say, sometimes we, we, we use words of sarcasm. Uh, those are, those are life-taking kinds of words, but words of sarcasm. We can say to a person, well, you know, you are so holy. Okay, depending how we say that. Or you are so loving. Maybe uh, using the, the passage here. You are so loving. And if we say that with sincerity, with an attitude of appreciation, it can be powerful. But we can also say it, you are so loving. It, you, you hear the difference? And what we actually mean is what? <laughs> you are not loving. Okay, that's what sarcasm is. And then a person says, wait, wait, that, you know, that's not all I said is you are so loving. You know, we, we try to hide behind as though the words themselves are all that, all that is being communicated. In reality, it's the tone of voice, it's attitude, it's the underlying meeting, meaning. <clears throat> it's feelings that we have about one another. All of this is the underlying issue. Uh, and, and again, these are the things that are actually being conveyed by the heart. And that's what we care about. We care about the heart and, and what this is, what this is re re reflecting on the inside more than we care about the words. There have been studies done. Uh, I don't know how accurate this is and how they figure out these percentages. But that only 7% of the meaning of when we talk is conveyed by the words. The rest is all uh, tone of voice, uh, um, facial expression, body language, we're paying attention to all of this in, in communication, which again comes down to saying that, that these things are uh, uh, reflecting what is in the heart. And then connection to other issues. Sometimes we will say something and the person who is listening to us is listening to echoes of a former conversation, okay? We, we've used even their words sometimes, and so we use their words in speaking to them, and they know we're actually referencing a former conversation when they said those words. You, you hear the connection to other issues. These are things that are all uh, tied to this uh, matter of how we say things. Uh, just switch here a little bit then um, we are not only speaking but we're also listening and evaluating and I want to say now I said here that the condition of the heart determines the con our, our, our communication 
what actually is being communicated, but I also want to say that's the condition of the heart that determines our ability to read those nonverbal messages. So, it's only out of, I can use the words from the last two sessions, it's only out of a loving heart that we can have loving speech. It's only out of a true heart that we can have true speech. However, love and truth are also necessary for us to accurately hear what is coming toward us from other people. Is, are, are you with me there? Let's just, let me illustrate. So, let's say that Let's say that I am upset at, uh, let's see, go back to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were upset at Jesus, right? So when they hear words from Jesus, they will attribute things to Jesus that don't match at all who Jesus is because they actually want to accuse him, okay? So the condition of their heart is actually causing them to reinterpret what Jesus is saying in order to actually make it something he doesn't intend. People who are angry, people who are bitter, typically there's no way that you can win. You say something nice to them, they'll attribute it to, to wrong motives, right? You say something uh, even just generic, just uh, information, and they'll attribute it to something. They can always turn it into some way that makes uh, you being the bad person. You hear what I'm saying? It's the condition of the heart actually determines our ability to read. Uh, have you ever wondered why Jesus was so good at understanding the hearts of people who were speaking to him, who came to him. Now, I know he was the son of God, but I'm saying also it was G the purity of Jesus' own heart. His commitment to other people's good, his, the truth of his being that enabled him when people spoke, he knew it, what heart it was coming from. Our ability to discern that does come back to our ability or the, the condition of our heart. Let's look at a third principle here. This one now is the other side of speaking. James, James 1, uh, 19, he says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. He goes on to say, because the wrath of man does not work, does not produce the righteousness of God. So, third principle is that healthy communication requires attentive listening. Be swift to hear. Be slow to speak. Uh, learning to be good listeners. Uh, and I, I'll say here that um, as we grow older and more mature, we have to, we have to really work at this. Uh, uh, just a word to you preachers who are here. Uh, sometimes, as, because we are preachers and we're, re we, uh, we're often looked to to speak, we're often asked to speak, people come to us for answers, sometimes uh, we, have, we have trouble listening. We have trouble, uh, we, we think we have to give an answer. And so just saying, uh, this, this teaching comes to all of us. Maybe especially we have to be careful about it the more mature we become that we don't assume that we have to always speak. We need to listen. We need to listen well. Human, humans desire to be understood. That's deep within us. We, we, we yearn for people to really understand us. And we don't just mean understand our words. I don't know how to describe this, but understanding is on, on two levels. I was talking to a couple years ago, <clears throat> talking to this couple that I hadn't met them before. Uh, I don't think they were, well, he might have been Mennonite background. Anyway, but they were having marriage problems. They came and I sat and I, uh, so I, I, I said, so uh, you have to tell me what you're dealing with so that we can look at it. And so they looked at each other and, she said, shall I start? And he said, sure, uh, go ahead. So she said, it's fascinating. She didn't talk about him. She started talking about herself. She said, well, she said, I, I struggle with anger. And she went on to describe uh, her anger problem. And 
Uh, so I listened to her and then um, after a bit she stopped and and she kind of looked at him and she said, so did I say it right? And, and he said, no. And so he began to describe her anger problem and he held forth for a while about um, her, her problem with anger and <clears throat> I, uh, yeah, listening to them, I, I, I started, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, ornery sometimes, okay, and uh, so I asked him, I said, uh, so do you understand your wife? He said, oh, I understand her perfectly. So my orneriness went to her and said, so do you feel understood? And she looked at him a little bit and I, it felt like she was looking to see if it's safe, but she said no. You hear this, this yearning to be understood is not just to understand our words or our actions or what we've done or what we've said. It's the yearning at a deeper level to be understood. To have somebody who knows what really is going on inside of us and the things that we're going through. And this is a, this is a human yearning. And this desire to be understood increases with distress. When we are in distress, we look for somebody that we can talk to often who will understand that. There's something about distress that is, a bit, that is alienating. And, and having somebody who understands it, there's, there, there's comfort in that. There's, even, if the, even if the situation doesn't change, if somebody understands us, somehow it becomes more bearable, which is really listening in a church setting, in a congregation of people. Listening is a ministry. We're, we're, actually, we're actually able to help a person talk about when we listen, it, it involves actually not just passively listening, but attentively listening and then asking additional questions, enabling the person to put into words what is difficult to verbalize. That, that's a good listener. So distress increases this desire to be understood. Disagreement uh, um, increases the desire to be understood. You just listen to two people in disagreement and they keep... They keep explaining themselves. Like, if I just say it again, if I say it uh, with more adjectives, if, if I say it a little louder, surely you'll, you'll get it. You'll, you'll understand. It's our, it's our, our desire with disagreement. We struggle. And I, I remember, I was just a young man. I remember there was this disagreement I had with a, a man who was a, a friend of mine and and I just thought all we have to do is talk and and so I explained it more and the more I explained it the worse it got <laughs> it just it, it wasn't there and part of that had to do because I wasn't listening I, I wasn't willing to actually think about his way of thinking sometimes in disagreement it's it's ironic that we're actually saying um we're saying things that really each other needs to hear. I remember uh, at the, it was at the back of our church. This is again years ago. There's two two brothers in church, and they were talking. We were, they were talking about our interaction as a congregation with other congregations, and they were disagreeing. And we we had uh, some joint meetings at that time with neighboring congregations, and and <clears throat> one of them was saying, "Look, we can't just open our arms to everybody and think that we can just interact with everybody." And the other one was saying, "Yeah, but we can't just put a little circle around ourselves and think we're the only ones." Now, if you're if you're looking at a the uh, the question, "Shall we interact with another group?" Both of those things are actually necessary. These men were not wrong. They were both right. It had to do with, it had to do with not listening to each other. They were afraid to acknowledge the other side for fear that it would push the decision that direction. Okay? But disagreement increases this desire to be understood. Which means that when we disagree, we should work hard at understanding the other perspective. Uh, that can happen by saying, so tell me more. H help me to understand. 
And it can say, when, when we've actually adequately listened, we can say, so if I understand you right, here's, here's what you're saying. And they can say, yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, when we can actually put it into words. And, and by the way, um, I remember reading a fellow who wrote a, about conflict. And he said, it's only when we are reasonably sure of the truth of our own understanding that we can be generous in listening to somebody else, okay? But when we're threatened, then, then we tend to want to explain our position instead of listening. So disagreement calls us to listen, to listen well. And then distance, distance has to do with uh, barriers, walls in relationship, it, and we yearn to be understood where we are alienated. So all of this, again, basic principle, healthy communication calls for active, attentive listening. So we need to listen well. Uh, I want to come back again to say that in a, in a church, in a congregation, we live in, a, in the kind of world where there's always going to be trouble. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Okay, so we go through distresses, through losses. They're physical things, they're relational things, which means that a significant way that we show love and care for each other is to listen. And we listen well. And it's a ministry, it enables people. Uh, sometimes, sometimes we don't have an answer. We can't fix the problem. And, and, and we simply need to, to bear each other's burdens. And a fourth principle then is from Ephesians 4 and verse 15. Uh, wanna, again, I've just uh, put the one verse uh, on the uh, projector there, but <clears throat> the whole passage is a passage about church relationships and how we are to be contributing to each other and enabling each other, building each other up. And... <clears throat> Paul then says, uh, by the way, just ahead of this, he says that we should not be like children, kind of thrown about, tossed to and fro uh, with different doctrines and subtle kinds of misrepresentations of truth. We shouldn't be like children there, but he says, speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him, even into Christ. And so the... Uh, the principle is <clears throat> that we need to speak the truth and we need to speak the truth in love. Uh, thinking about truth and love, truth sets the standard for what we say. It needs to be accurate. It needs to be truthful. And I, I want to say here in, in uh, church settings, one of the tests of our, of our own truthfulness, the truth of being that I was talking about last evening, one of the tests of our truth of being is that when we're representing somebody that we disagree with or somebody who has hurt us, we can accurately, we can accurately represent them. And, and you know, this, this tests us. Um, maybe before I go there, I'll look at the next one here. So truth sets the standard for what we say. Love sets the standard for how we say it and why we say it and to whom we say it and for what reason we say it and even sometimes if we say it. There were times when Jesus did not say things. He intentionally remained silent. There are times when it's better not to say something, even though it is the truth. Okay, again, love guides that. Our speech, our actions are all directed to be guided by love so that we are acting and speaking for what is best for the other person. Sometimes it's better not to speak. Love, love guides us in that. So that we are, our speaking is always about what will be best for that person. So love guides that. So it, sometimes we, we're caught here because we think, well, it's true. So, and, and that's kind of all we're going by. But sometimes the truth, actually I should say, when the truth is not spoken in love, it can actually do more damage than good. Truth is necessary, but love needs to guide us. How we say it, why we say it, to whom we say it. I mentioned that truth, 
of being helps us to accurately represent other people when we're talking about them, when we're conveying a situation that happened. Can we, act, can we say what actually happened there, uh, honestly? You know, uh, even, <laughs> I just want to say that even preachers uh, struggle here, and I'm going to give you an example that I hope doesn't feed any kind of anti anti-minister uh, uh, feelings or sentiments here. I was in a meeting, this was years ago, I was in a meeting of ministers and there was, there was controversy going on. It, it was, there was some deep stuff, uh, controversy and um, the bishops had been together apparently talking about some things and I'm not a bishop so I, I, was, I wasn't in on that. But these two of my friends, good, good men, friends of mine, bishops, uh, had gotten into some kind of a tangle uh, over this controversy. I don't remember what the controversy was. And, and the, the one was talking to me about this later and he was telling about his conversation. And he said, you know, he talks about, he talks about uh, listening, the importance of listening. And he did 75% of the talking. And he, he wasn't very happy about this conversation. And, and I had not heard it, so I didn't know. But I was listening to this guy. And then um, Later, I think later that day or the next day, uh, I, I was listening to the other one in the conversation, both of them friends of mine, and he was telling me, and I was getting a really different picture of this conversation. It didn't sound, almost sound like the same conversation, and again, I'm a little ornery, uh, and I, I, I said to this second one, I said, so are you saying he did more of the talking than you did? And he said, oh, he did 90% of the talking. Those percentages just don't quite add up, okay? And <clears throat> but it just uh, it's it's easy for us to to, to misrepresent. And uh, a principle that I'm not going to I'm not to go, going to go into, but which also relates here to this subject is in times of tension. It is important for us to recognize when the tension rises in a conversation, we typically hear words coming toward us more clearly than we hear words going from us. We remember the words that came to us more clearly than the words that went from us. That, that's just a general principle here. And, and so it calls for maturity for us to, to accurately represent things that were um, said or uh, how a conversation went. So we'll often remember different parts of a conversation as compared to other parts of that conversation. So truth sets a standard for what we say. Love sets a standard for how, for why, to whom, for what reason, uh, when we say it, if we say it. Uh, this is also important, I want to say, for discipleship. We don't, we don't, we don't say things to young members that we would say to older members. We, we just recognize there's a time that they'll, it'll be appropriate to talk to them about this. But love guides that. And now we come back again to uh, the theme that we've been looking at in this uh, series. For truth and love. To speak the truth in love. For truth and love to be in our speech. They first need to be in our hearts. So it's come, coming back to saying, God, in you who are love, need to make me to be loving. You who are truth need to make me to be true so that my words, uh, the things that come out of my mouth are loving and true. And uh, again, coming back then to saying that God is this source. If, if I'm going to have heart truth, truth of being, I need to be in relationship with God, allowing his presence, my time with him to, to purge and to make me true and uh, giving me then also heart love, heart truth and heart love um, in my speech because it's in my heart. Um, again, just want to say to, to you as you think about this uh, series on interpersonal relationships, my desire is that it makes you hungry for God that you, you realize, we realize how much we need him. And so we come back to him continually to shape us, to make us more like Jesus. I would like if we could pray. Heavenly Father, thank you 
for your grace to us through Jesus. Thank you for being our Father. Thank you for this congregation. Thank you for the time that we have had together. And I'm praying in Jesus' name that you would continue to work these things into our hearts. Our Lord, we, we fall short of your glory and we want to be restored into that image that you desire. Uh, we can honor you. We can glorify you. I pray that uh, the, the brothers and sisters at uh, Sandy Ridge would be united in heart in seeking you and allowing you to uh, shape them. And they would grow up as they speak truth and love would grow up into the image of Christ. And I ask it in his name. Amen.